as a market researcher, it's music to my ears to hear healthcare catching up to other industries in terms of, of assimilating data. I can tell you in my days when I worked with Procter & Gamble, the head of market research reports directly to the CEO. They have a C-suite title, just like the, the chief marketing officer does. I can tell you, nobody at Procter & Gamble makes a move without data. The market researchers, it's my heaven because they're like gods there. I've seen brand managers run down the hallway with their advertising testing score. I got an 86, I got an 86. They were so excited because they could run their ad as is. That's how important data is to them. And data should be just as important to us. Having a strong consumer insights or market insights department is so critical. You know, I always joke when they say about big data. I was doing big data back in the 80s. It's just bigger data today. That's all it really is. I was doing neural networking um, back when you would run something on the mainframe and you'd go to lunch and hope it was done by the time you got back. Now, you blink and it's done. So it's just faster and bigger, but it's the same types of things. So as you're adapting and becoming these new 21st century marketers, to be successful, you have to embrace data, just like they do in packaged goods or at General Motors or Visa or Apple. Data is your friend. We are your friends. We're not the ones that come in and say, oh, your ads are ugly, sorry. We want to help you to be as successful as possible. So that's my pitch for my fellow market researchers. So let's talk about some market research. So every year, I do an on the bus uh, study, and I call it my kitchen sink. It's usually, I put together questions. Some of them I ask every year for trending. Other questions are, I just talk to a bunch of clients and friends and say, okay, what's interesting now? What do we want to talk about? And so this past year, everyone's like, I want to know what millennials are doing digitally in the healthcare space. So we're going to talk about just that. So just real quick background on how we did it. Online survey, national, sample size of 400. People say, well, why 400? And I say, because I'm paying for it. It was fielded last December. And it was a national sample. And I did an oversample of millennials to make sure that we had enough of those folks. Just also quickly, whenever I'm showing you some charts, anytime you see arrows or if it's a bolded scores, that just means it's statistically significantly higher. All right, what did we learn? I'm just gonna walk you through a whole bunch of cool stuff that, uh, that we learned. All right, we asked folks starting out, what are some of the top healthcare concerns or health concerns that you have? And our poor millennial children are stressed because they're not winning all those participation trophies anymore. I'm sorry. <laughs> but they were most likely to say, complaining of low energy, not enough time for me, and I suffer from migraines. So their health concerns are very much more mental health oriented, not physical health, because they're still young, and uh, you know, they they're, feel like they're gonna live forever. The Gen Xers, starting to get into back and joint pain, and um, uh, smoking, higher level of smoking than others. That's interesting, too. Um, and the, the, the boomers in my generation, we're worried about my health as we age, because we're not getting any younger. Um, we take pre uh, prescription drugs, more than we want to add up, and we also have a, a higher level of, of, of diabetes. And then the silent generation, our parents and grandparents, they're, they're taking prescription drugs, almost all of them. It's really become better living through chemicals as how um, our, our, the seniors are, are, are existing. Um, I'm worried about my health as I age, of course. I have arthritis, I have diabetes, um, I have or had, had cancer, and I have um, or had uh, hip and knee replacement. <clears throat> so there, obviously things start to break as we get older. So it, most of these are very, not that surprising, except with the millennials. So millennials, you know, you know one thing too, uh, to tell you in other work that I've seen, um, I, as a researcher, I love to study uh, the neurosciences and what we're understanding about the brain. Here's what's going on millennials. Millennials are the first generation that's wired differently. That means their synapses fire fundamentally differently than ours do. That's why in the military, when they're looking for people to fly the drones, they want gamers because they understand their brain is wired from basically brain to joystick. Because they did it all the time? Because when they were playing with their, their Xbox. Absolutely. So see, all that slouching around on the couch is paying off. 
They can serve our country and bomb people. So the other thing is, in, um, what's an interesting phenomenon is in the airline industry. Older pilots are put on the older planes that are still fly-by-white. The younger pilots coming up, they're flying the newer planes that are the joystick. They struggle to go back and forth because their brain is wired from brain to hand coordination is fundamentally wired with pilots my age and pilots that are more in the millennial age range. Interesting, just think about that. So their mind and the way they go about making decisions, they're wired very differently. I can tell you also about millennials, um, <clears throat> I was reading Ad Age recently and the whole front page article was, millennials don't care about your brand. Millennials' idea of brand loyalty is so different than ours. When I, when I do my, my brand commitment modeling, I find that the, the folks that are most emotionally attached to their healthcare brand tend to be older. There's a definite linkage where it's like, Opa! The younger, the younger folks, it's not that they don't like you, they're just ambivalent towards you. I call that, that death by vanilla. They just don't care. If you don't do right by them, they'll go find something else. So their definition of loyalty is very different. One of the primary drivers of loyalty to them is being genuine or authentic. What are you doing to save the planet beyond just make money? They can smell BS a mile away. So that has a big impact on how do we develop a relationship with a group of folks that's really not even ready to date us yet. We're moving into, with ACOs, to be um, your BFF, and we want to be there even when you're healthy. And most people are saying, ah, you know what? You've just been taking care of me when I'm sick for 100 years. And all of a sudden, you want to be my BFF, especially with millennials. They are having a, a hard time with us being, wanting to be their, their BFFs. So pop-up ads. Who here feels that pop-up ads drive them crazy? Yes, but they're happening more and more and, and more. Of course, I will tell you, did anybody read what Procter & Gamble did earlier this year? Anybody read what P&G did? They shook YouTube to its core. <coughs> Second quarter, they removed all of their, their video ads from like YouTube and, and other of those types of, of services and just said, you know what? We can't trust where our ads pop up. They're gonna pop up to questionable content. And if you can't control that, we're out of here. So they took all second quarter up, about $167 million in spending. Yeah. And here's what they found. Their organic sales growth went up 2%. So they said, you know what? Eh, maybe we, this, this whole online video ad stuff is not all it's cracked up to be. I was at, um, I don't know if any of you went to HCIC. I was at HCIC a week or two ago. And somebody from Google was there. So naturally, being the troublemaker that I am, I raised my hand and said, hey, you know, what, what's Google's reaction to this P&G thing? And you, you could just say, like, blood went off his face. And he said, I'm not authorized to discuss that. You know what that answer said to me? P&G just scared the shit out of Google. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think it could happen. Of course, I know that's going to happen. <laughs> so think about it. That has huge ramifications for spending. Because if P&G is finding that it's not working, what does that mean? What does that mean for the rest of us? So we asked folks, um, I am comfortable with companies learning my online habits so they can customize ads and offers to me. Do you agree or disagree? Mm -hmm. Millennials, 31% agreed. 25% Gen X, boomers 11. You know, you gotta like the silence. It's, I, think, I think the grandparents are starting to kind of get hip, you know? <laughs> of course, we all know there's three segments of seniors. The go-goes, the slow-goes, and the no-goes. And so it looks like the go-goes um, of course, uh, one of my dear friends calls it face page. He says, I don't like being on face page. But uh, I'm like, well, why don't you try Facebook? But, um, so you can see that younger folks, they're more comfortable because they, they haven't known a day. I mean, try to talk to a millennial about DOS or my favorite, an eight track. Hoo -hoo. So they don't even know a world without any of that. And then we ask folks, um, I can't stand pop-up ads. I ignore and skip. The older is the blue line and the millennials are the, the kind of the orange line. So you can see 60, 80% um, of older folks said, I, I skipped them just automatically. 
Whereas millennials were much more likely to say, not a big fan, but I click on those that are relevant, or I like pop-up ads and tend to look at them to find relevant ones. And so, um, next one please. Uh, Google Chrome is the dominant browser used by millennials. Of course, Google's taking over the world. We know that. So that's the vast majority of, of millennials are using Google. And 65% of millennials start with a Google search. I can tell you a lot of the website uh, research that I do, they're not coming directly to your website. In fact, I did, I did a test in some focus groups. What I found was when people go to your website directly, it's harder for them to get to where they want than if they start with a Google search. So they feel, if I go to Google first, Google, it's almost like Google's a, a, a guy or a girl. You know, it's Google, he or she will get me to your website better than your search function will. Whether that's true or not, it doesn't matter. That's what's in their minds. And that transcends just millennials. So think about that. They think that Google does a better job getting them deep into your website than you guys do. I can tell you search is the number one pain point with, with websites. And I'm going to show you some numbers of what they expect. And Google just came out. Um, the new load time is what? Three seconds? It used to be six, then four, now three. Pretty soon it's going to load before the person even clicks on it. I mean, think about, think about that. Three seconds is their new load time. That's what the Google guy was saying at HCIC. Three seconds, you've got to be up and running. We are creating a, an environment of it's got to be instant. And that's not always easy. <clears throat> Have you visited a hospital website recently? 44% of millennials, significantly higher than everyone else. And why they visited? Millennials um, were more likely to search for health and wellness. No surprise. So millennials, they're less likely to be sick. So the question is, if you want to develop a relationship with them, you're not going to start with sick care. You're going to start with, we want to give you something before you give us something. That's another thing with millennials. They want something before they give something. So don't ask to get married on the first date. We do that too much in marketing. The first date should be just that, and you should be the one first offering. I can tell you, here's an analogy um, when you start developing a relationship with millennials. We always say, well, they're not ready for us yet. You know, we'll, we'll hit up on them when they're in their 40s and really get sick. Here's the problem. When I was in banking in the early 80s, we started a seniors, when they used to have seniors checking and things like that. And overwhelmingly, seniors said, F you. When I was young and struggling and didn't have a lot of money, you wouldn't give me a loan. You wouldn't give me a credit card. Now that I've got a lot of money, you want me? You blew it. You should have me back then. And that's the same thing in healthcare with millennials. You've got to invest in them now so they grow up with you. Step back now, four steps later. If you wait until they're ready for healthcare services, you probably will have already lost them. So you've got to start building the relationship now. All right, next. Now, let's talk a little bit about um, website expectations. Our, uh, article or video load time. Immediately, 20% of millennials said it's got to load now. And the maximum acceptable length of a video on average is not a whole lot of difference between the, the, the groups. Four to five minutes. So what was it? Was it, um, um, one of, was it tr President Truman, that, or one of the presidents uh, a while ago said, if I can give a two-hour speech, I can prepare it uh, very quickly. If I have to give a ten-minute speech, it takes me days to write. Mark Twain. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so, how can we be brief with people? Remember, millennials, their their attention span is not long. So we've got it. We've got to hit them and really be impactful. All right. Next. Um, online reviews. Prefer quality ranking organizations over consumer-driven reviews to help choose a hospital. Um, what's interesting is 52% of millennials. So I'm seeing a rise in interest like in health grades. I, I will tell you with millennials that, um, sorry if there's any US news and World Report people here, but you're kind of becoming Buick. Well, I had a millennial focus group say, oh, US news, isn't that the magazine my dad used to read? That's a death nail. 
where so the momentum is declining on US news and the momentum is increasing with health grades. Health grades is the young and US news represents the old. I don't know how much longer US news is gonna be around. I'd be, I'd be surprised if 10 years from now it's in existence. I could be wrong, but I just don't see it having positive momentum. It's definitely old school. Everything I see in research, whereas health grade is more, or whether it's a Yelp or an Angie's List, what have you. Um, but consumers, especially millennials, they want reviews and ratings. I had a millennial say the best thing to me. He said, I go online when I'm looking for a doc, I discount the reviews of five stars, and I discount the one stars, because they're either too darn happy, or they're mad, and there's something wrong with them. So he says, I look at the stars in the middle. That's where I get the most useful, um, balanced information. I thought that was brilliant. So. Ratings and reviews, you really, you really need them both. Um, oh, oh, um, neither rankings of um, review sites are useful. 28%, so 3 in 10 older folks, don't want anything. Millennials, almost all of them, want to have uh, those reviews because they're going online, especially when they're choosing a physician. Here, here's, here's, the, here's the process a millennial goes through to pick a doc. They go, if they have insurance, they go to the network to see who's in network. I can tell you right now, no matter, even if you're Dr. Oz, you aren't good enough to say, I'm a little more expensive, but I'm worth it. If you're out of network, they're not coming to you anymore because they can't afford in-network coverage. Out-of-pocket on in-network is, is really struggling for a lot of people. So um, they, they, they look, who's in-network, then they look what offices are closest, then who's taking patients, then they get to reviews to see who they might like. But they've gone through three table stakes that aren't necessarily brand related before they even get to who they might like. So three layers deep before they're looking at, at, at reviews. And then gone online to a social networking site and shared your experiences about a hospital or doctor. Only 10% of we older people have done that. 45% of millennials have gone online and talked about a hospital or a doctor. That's huge. That's almost half. And again, this is a year old. I bet this will be higher. And then have you gone on to a hospital's website and shared an experience? Now it's only 32% of millennials. So if they're going on, they're not going on your site as much. They're going out on other independent sites. So again, how do you control that message? As marketers, you know, I've been in this 33 years, the biggest change I've seen for marketers is we used to own the message and it was all about us talking to the consumer and them receiving the message. That was it, that's how marketing worked. Now, there's a really good book called Brand Hijacked and, it, and it's about how we have to accept the fact that our brands and our messages have been hijacked by the consumer. We are now just part of the conversation. We are no longer controlling it. It is two way and at best we can slip in to the conversation and be part of it. We are no longer solely dictating the brand conversation. That's a huge change for us to accept as, as markers. It has fundamentally changed advertising. <clears throat> so next. Average number of ratings consumers need to see to find them useful in, in choosing a hospital. And it's not as many as you think. You don't need hundreds and hundreds. I mean, we're looking at, with millennials, 17. So if you've, if you've got 15 to 20, um, uh, uh, ratings, especially for millennials who are doing the most looking, you've got that. So I have, I, the reason I put that in there is a lot of clients are like, oh, I know that, you know, with, with um, Hotels.com or, or Travelocity, they've got thousands of reviews. We're never going to get that many. And I'm like, well, maybe you don't need that many. So here we're seeing, and I had a, a buddy of mine did some research too done at the uh, University of Kentucky. And he found that 15 was the minimum you needed to have some uh, enough that people were comfortable. And the same with, um, with reviews, about the same number, anywhere from 15 to 20. So it's not, so for you to say, oh, we need, we need hundreds if not thousands, you don't. Granted, over time, you want to build up, but don't think that it's an insurmountable uh, starting point. Next. <clears throat> and then ratings worth, uh, versus reviews. Um, Older folks really um, want, want both. With millennials, they're, they're, there's, I, have to, I have not dug more uh, deeply into this, I, I apologize, but it, there's definitely some bifurcation. You know, there's, some, there's some reviews um, oriented millennials and then there's some uh, 
um, they want ratings. So I, need to, I definitely need to, to look into a little more deeper on that one. Um, but the bottom line is most people, regardless of age, they want both. One or the other is an incomplete picture. Both, both help to, to put each other in context. Next. So top smartphone uses for healthcare information seeking. So 29% of millennials have used a hospital's app to check ER wait times. Who has ER wait times with an app? Look around. I no hand going up. All right. Think about that. I, I do a lot of, in fact, I just did a huge study for a client on ER journey mapping. And I can't tell you how many folks said, I'll drive past, if not granted, you have to be in a market where there's multiple ERs, but I'll drive past one if I know the one farther has a 10 minute or no wait. Because I know if they're not publishing their wait times, it's probably four hours. So I'd rather drive an extra half hour and still be home faster. So publishing your, your ER wait times, and I'll tell you, in, these, in the focus groups I did, they, went, they won, went one step further and said, not only do I want you to publish your ER wait times, when I come into the ER, I want to I wanna be able to instantly download an app that tells me where I am in the queue. So I constantly can see where I am. Is this based on if they've used it or would they use it? <clears throat> Have used. Have. I like to ask behavioral questions more than behavioral intention because how many times do we say, oh, let's do lunch? Yeah, we never do. So I like behavior questions when possible. So, um, so what have they done on their smartphone? They're looking for jobs. Your website is a big recruitment tool. What message are you sending to potential um, uh, staff members? Look up symptoms, go to a hospital website, make online donations, wellness programs, health magazines, schedule a virtual appointment. As we're gonna see coming up, millennials are very comfortable with a virtual visit. Very comfortable. Look at MD Live with their relationship with Walgreens. I can go on my Walgreens app, hit a button, and that's MD Live, and like I think it's 40 or 50 bucks. Boom, I'm talking to a doc. A lot of technology is happening to us, not by us. And I can tell you one of our biggest competitors is like a CVS, a Walgreens, a Walmart. I, I, I can tell you with certainty, based on discussions with some folks, CVS wants to own primary and urgent care. And guess what? Retail has learned healthcare faster than healthcare has learned retail. So they've learned our business, we have not learned their business. And the retailization of healthcare is here, period. Because especially with millennials, they assume clinical competency. That's just assumed. Otherwise, why would you be there? So what differentiates is how do you treat me as an individual, as in the experience? The experience, that retail experience, is where we will differentiate ourselves with the up and coming generation. And it was silent. 30% said, what's a smartphone? We have some family members that still have one of those uh, flip phones with the, um, with the what, is, what brand is it that has the? Nextel. Oh my gosh. So uh, I think they're DOS users too. So, but um, you can see that there's still a lot of folks that don't have smartphones. But that's, that's changing as we all age. Next. 15% of millennials follow you on Facebook. Almost no one outside. So if you're like, oh, we've got a thousand or X number of Facebook followers, number one, I tell people, find out how many are staff members. Because when I'm doing my website research for clients, I'm able to break out people that say, I, I have liked you on, like this brand on Facebook. Um, and I, I, I segment it by staff versus consumers. And then all of a sudden, that good number all they're doing is navel gazing. They're getting their own people to like them, and that's it. And so, our, what, is, what is your Facebook page? Is it something that's relevant to millennials? Because they are following. Next. Ways millennials are significantly more likely to come in contact with you. Again, liking your Facebook page, just even visiting it, following you on Twitter, or as my friend calls it, Twitter. Follow on LinkedIn. Signed up and haven't yet used the patient portal. So you're getting 12% of millennials have signed up for the patient portal, but they haven't used it. You know, that's, that's a non-starter. If they're not using it, all they did, you've got to convert them to using it. What are you, what are you doing to help millennials 
to, to utilize a technique and a technology that they're very comfortable with. Clearly, they don't feel the need. So what else can you add into the EMR that is maybe more health-related, that they would want to interact with it? Next. <clears throat> Millennials are significantly more likely to interact with the health system via almost every social media channel there is. But Facebook is clearly, you know, we have so many different ways of interacting with and new technologies. What I'm finding is with our healthcare clients, we just did a, um, a survey, which I'll give you the link to, our third annual healthcare marketers survey. I don't know if any of you took it, but um, we do it in conjunction with Greystone.net, the folks that put on HCIC. And so we asked healthcare marketers around the country, where are they investing their digital efforts? And what we're seeing now is there's a consolidation kind of back to Facebook and Google. So all of these other things that people were experimenting with, they're, they're, they're dropping off from a corporate standpoint. So I think you're gonna, just like the rest of the world's becoming oligopolistic, you know, like banking did and the airline industry consolidated, we are going through a consolidation, we are going to become an oligopolistic industry over the next uh, seven to 10 years. So that has huge ramifications for size and scope. And it's happening here as well. Um, none of these, only half millennials said that they don't interact at all on any of these with you, but it's almost eight or nine out of 10 of older folks don't. So you just think your digital strategy, even if you're trying to reach older folks with a specific um, you know, a joint replacement or, or bariatrics or cancer, who's hearing the message more are millennials. That's the challenge because if they're not on, they're not necessarily seen. Next. Do you have a PCP? Only seven in 10 millennials have a primary care physician. And they're more likely um, to have switched doctors because of a change in health plans, because probably moving jobs around, as younger folks do, um, or and um, um, they have poor service. Millennials are really the first generation to say, you know what, I don't care if it's, if it's Dr. Welby, who they don't know who that is, um, but they'll say, if your office staff is horrible, they're just as important to my overall experience as you are the doctor. Remember, with, with, again, with older folks, you would go through just awful staff if you loved your doctor. But the, for the doctor to say, oh, I don't handle that staff. I can't control them. Millennials are like, you hire them. They're in your office. They represent you. I want a complete experience, not just a good physician experience. So the retailization of healthcare is absolutely front and center in the physician's office. Millennials are saying, my time is just as valuable as yours. And millennials without a PCP are significantly more likely to go to a hospital ER for primary care. Isn't that special? A third of them. So we're getting a lot of ER care because they just don't have a primary care physician. And we wonder why our costs are going up. I find in my ER research, most people that go to an ER for non-emergency, they know they really shouldn't be there. They're not surprised, they know this, this, this is not serious, but I don't really know other options and you've done a lousy job telling me what my other options are. Next. Agree with this statement. The bottom three are the most interesting with millennials, with the yellow, with the yellow um, bars. At this point in my life, I could really use use a health or life coach more than a PCP. For almost half of millennials said, yeah. Because remember, they're stressed, we saw earlier. So think about that. Here's an opportunity. Why not have, in addition to physicians, why not have life coaches or health coaches for them? I think that in, 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 if we want to truly be in the wellness business with them, we should look into having financial counseling. Because what stresses you out and makes you sicker than not being able to pay the bills. And as we're gonna see here, millennials can't pay the bills. So maybe in your ambulatory care center, you, you create it more as a destination, and it has financial counseling. There's a health and wellness coach, not just a doctor when you're sick. We have to start thinking out of the box in healthcare. Or what's gonna happen is, we're gonna have more of what Amazon is doing with their skunk works. 1492, who's read about that? If I'm Cerner and Epic, I'm scared to death with what they're going to be doing. And I can tell you, we've got friends in, in Silicon Valley, and I know they are just excited to come into healthcare because they think we are right for takeover. 
So, as I said, technology is happening to us, not by us. Not that I'm trying to be doom and gloom here. I'm trying to give you information so you can get in the game first. Get to the people when they're young. Millennials are a future investment. And then 38%, significantly higher than older, said, my doctor doesn't seem to know what's going on with staff and how they treat patients. Remember I alluded to that? And then, service at my doctor's office has gotten so bad, I'm considering changing doctors, four in 10 millennials. They don't suffer fools. If you're not taking care of them, they're emboldened. Whereas older people might say, oh, you know, I've been with Dr. Smith for 30 years. I know it's gotten bad, but I just can't. He knows me so well. Young people don't have that connection. You're as good as your last visit with them. Next. <clears throat> virtual visits. 20%, one in five millennials have had a virtual visit in the past year. And you can see how, how small it is with the, with the older generation. Um, likely to use a virtual visit service from an independent organization. 76% of millennials said, it doesn't have to be part of the health system. I'm totally cool with going like, um, uh, what is it, American Well or MD Live, places like that. They're okay, because remember, they're not that brand loyal. And then likely to pay out of pocket for virtual visit if not covered by insurance. For almost half a millennial said, yeah, I'll pay out of pocket. No problem. As I said, MD Live on the Walgreens app, I think it's 40 or 50 bucks. And I talked to someone at Walgreens and they said it's doing really well. But it's mostly younger people coming on. Again, that's our future. Next. 24% of millennials have used an online scheduling app. Again, if you don't have an online scheduling app, you're way behind the times. Again, I had, I had a person in a focus group say to me recently, and in, I'll do my best angst or angry voice, but she just said, why is it that I can get a restaurant reservation on open table, no problem, but I have to call and argue with some surly person at my doctor's office to try to get an appointment. What's wrong with you people? Our excuses about how we're different than every other industry, they're not bought anymore. I call it disruptive expectations. The days of the patient are gone. The days of the consumer are here. And their expectations are very different than a patient's. Patients are passive, consumers are demanding. And the sooner we accept that the retailization of healthcare is here, the better we're all gonna be. Because it's coming. Next. Agree with this statement. Um, having a cell phone is more important to me than having health insurance. Significantly higher for millennials. It's more important to have a social life than to have health insurance. Health insurance is just not that big a deal for millennials. How do we, how do we interact with that type of a, of a mindset? And then I prefer working at an employer that created an annual bonus uh, based on a healthy lifestyle. Well, pretty much everybody working likes that idea. Next. All right, this is a fun one. I've never asked this before. But what would you do with 100 bucks left at the end of the month? Older folks, almost all of them said save it. Millennials, car repair, new clothes, maybe health insurance, a night out on the town. They're not savers. They don't have a saving mentality. Remember with our parents and grandparents, they said, oh, I was a depression era baby. Oh, yeah. Remember that? That mentality was really strong. My parents were depression era. When my, when my mom died, I knew she had hidden tens of thousands of dollars in her library books. So I'm in the room shaking out all these books and it's raining, I'm making it rain. And my dad's like, what the hell? I said, yeah, she told me not to tell you because you'd spend it. So, but that's, that's, that mentality is gone now. I think the average 401k has $34,000 in it. For what age? For just forever, for all. But for millennials, I would bet it's, it's a lot, lot less. That saving mentality is, is gone now. You know, they're not living to work, they're working, um, um, working to, just to live. So they're not into, I mean, if you've read the study that the AMA did recently on young physicians coming out, um, they're not looking for the big income. They would accept a lower income, but not be on call on weekends. Their work-life balance is very different. That has huge implications for us. Not only do we need more doctors, we need more and more doctors because they're not gonna work 60 hours a week. I can tell you my nephew just graduated as a pediatrician. He was gonna become a pediatric oncologist and he said, you know what? The extra time it's gonna take for me to get that, I'm gonna miss my children growing up 
It's not worth it. I would rather take less money, go right into pediatric practice right now, have decent hours, and watch my children grow up. So my, my 26-year-old nephew just exemplified what's happening with young physicians coming out. That has a big impact on all of us. Next. Millennials are significantly more likely to have and use a wearable. And it's probably an Apple Watch. No surprise to a lot of us. I know someone else that wants an Apple Watch for Christmas. <laughs> By the way, that is my business partner, and I'm very fortunate my wife also, Tony. So, yeah, there you go. So, so you get a clap, I don't. That's cool. As you should. I'm just the chief cook and bottle washer in this business. So. What is wearable? All watches? Or what, what oh, a wearable is, 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 could be like a Fitbit. It's something that, that, that has, a health, yeah, has a health tracking phone. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Next. So, and again, some of these are random, so they're just things that people were interested in, in my, uh, my, of my clients. Um, having a female OBGYN, millennial women, 80%, um, um, have a, an OB, and 69% of them say they want a female, but that, that drops off into their mid-30s. But with, with, so if you've got a lot of millennials, the gender of your physicians matters. Next. Transparency uh, and, and price shock. This is what I've been tracking um, for a long time. Um, so it's basically saying, have you ever asked about prices for healthcare? So millennials, 43% have asked about prices, and they either did it online or they did it email, whereas as they get older, everybody else is calling in. And then, uh, did you choose the lowest price option? 45% of millennials said yes, and that translates to 19%, or one in five millennials that saw any healthcare in the past year asked about pricing and chose the lowest price. That's why they like Walgreens or CVS. If you've ever gone into their, their clinics, they have a big screen TVs with all the services with pricing. Physical, $69. You know, flu shot, $20. I mean, even for us, we called our doctor for flu shot. He's like, well, yeah, it's 50 bucks, and we'll try to get you in next week, and blah, 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 blah. And Walgreens was like, yeah, come on in, 20 bucks. Okay, goodbye. You're done. Who wouldn't want that? My time is valuable. That's another thing in healthcare. We have to absolutely understand that our customer's time is as valuable as ours. Think about it with, the, with what happened after the, the fall in 2008. A lot of people went back to jobs that are hourly. So what that means is, and what they tell me in focus groups, when I go to the doctor, if it's a two hour wait, I've clocked out. They don't understand. This is not only costing me my copay, but it's costing me lost wages that I'll never get back. Do they even care? You know, when I do focus groups, and in fact, when Tony's behind watching uh, the glass, she'll say, how are you not crying when you hear these stories? And I said, it's taking years to, and biting my lips sometimes. I hear some awful stories that we put people through with health insurance as well as health care that they don't think we're, we're as, as one person said in the ED focus group recently, you care more about your you-know-what deductible and paperwork than my illness. Because what do we do when they walk into the ED? They're bleeding all over. $100, please. Or, or, yeah, where's your insurance card? Where's your insurance card? That should not be the first words out of our, our mouth. So again, you've got a lot of people are looking for price transparency. What do we do when they call for price transparency? What's our usual answer? Well, it depends. That's hard to say. That's not what they want to hear. Next. Look at these numbers. 23% of Americans um, last year, 2016, have had a significant financial hardship due to medical bills. It was 15% two years prior. Things aren't getting better, like we think. And of millennials, 43% of them said they've had a significant hardship. They're already coming out of college with $200,000 plus debt. And that's not for a medical degree. That may be just as like for, you know, as my parents would say, underwater basket weaving minor. You know, they're coming out with just insurmountable debt. And then you add health care if they don't have a great job yet, and they don't have great coverage. So they're getting buried. And then we wonder why, in that first chart that I showed you, their big concerns were stress and not enough time. So what are we doing to help them with their health and well-being beyond just fixing a broken bone or a sinus infection? What are we doing to help them get through those difficult years? That's where you can be a strong brand. Brands want to be a hero. How do you be the hero? 
even if it's someone that maybe isn't ready to give you a lot of money because they're not physically sick, how can you be the hero with them by recognizing that their health and well-being is beyond just their physicalness? Next. So, lastly here, obviously the demographics are changing. You know, for the first time, you know, the, the, the Caucasian race is, it's really not the dominant race anymore. We are truly becoming a very, very population. And so, you know, we've got a lot of college degrees, but we got lower income. So we've got a lot of poor, well-educated people, especially in the millennial generation. And again, we wonder about their stress levels. Next one. And then again, insurance um, uh, is changing by age as well. So lastly here, let's leave you with a couple of, uh, next one please. Some takeaways, next. And if this hasn't been available to you, um, I wanna make sure, is it? It will be. It will be, okay, good, I want. These are in PowerPoint. Feel free to use them and, and put them into your other presentations any way you want. This is, this is you know, I love doing this every year. This is kind of my, my gift to my friends. So um, anything that's useful, please just grab it. So here's like, I got my top 10 or 12 takeaways. Um, do you offer information to help millennials stay healthy and de-stress on your website? Millennials equal Google Chrome and Google searches, period. Physician rating review systems are key to growth for your organization. Um, when picking a hospital, millennials prefer a quality ranking organization over a consumer driven. Um, don't discount health grades versus Angie's List or Yelp. You need both. The good news is there's really not a huge hurdle to overcome when it comes to ratings. You know, 15, 20 ratings. You don't need hundreds of, of, or, or thousands to get started. Millennials are using their smartphone. I mean, it, it's not even a phone anymore. If anybody who's trying to call a millennial child realizes you can't call them, but you can text them and all of a sudden they're there. <laughs> I've got friends that literally will text their kids up in the bedroom as opposed to yell up, come down for dinner. Or they'll text at the table with each other. That's a good one. Pretty soon our voices are gonna go away. We won't need to talk anymore. We'll just be texting. So, uh, do you have an effective mobile, mobile strategy that is the driver of an omni-channel experience? And what about, you know, I didn't talk about this. I'm gonna put it in my next study. What about Echo and, and Google? Voice strategy. Do we, do we have a voice strategy? At some point, they're not even gonna need their thumbs anymore. They'll just say, hey, hey Siri, or hey, hey Google, I need to go to the doctor who's close by. So where are we in the voice strategy? I haven't gotten an answer from anybody yet, but that's the next thing coming. <clears throat> Facebook followers, millennial, but that's about it. You have to have a broad-based digital strategy to meet your audience where they are, and even more than a digital strategy, I don't even like that we call it digital strategy, because it, it's not. It's like saying, oh, in our, in our advertising department, our communications department, we just hired a billboard person. You've never hired a billboard person. You've never hired a radio person. You've hired a marketing or an advertising expert that knew all of it. Digital is just one more language that we speak to people. So pretty soon, we need to get away from a digital marketing strategy nomenclature, because that's not what it is. It's another language that we speak to people. Um, no longer can a great doctor alone carry a week office experience. They're looking for a full retail-like experience, period. Next. This could be one way retailers um, cut into your primary care space. Um, um, this health coach, I can tell you again, talking to some retailers, they're actually, I had one, I said, and I won't say who it is, but it was a major um, retailer. And I said, what about this whole thing about getting health coaches at your retail clinics? And she just smiled and said, I can't talk about that. So basically what she said is, heck yeah, we're already on it. So that scares me. You know, you learn more from what people won't say than what they do say. And that spoke volumes to me. So again, what about a health coach? Think outside the box. Having a financial planner. Why not? So um, as I said before, more retail competition um, for that primary care dollar, period. Um, one of four millennials use online scheduling. Open table virtually eliminated the age-old practice of calling. Can't remember the last time we've called um, to make a restaurant reservation. You don't need to anymore. In fact, we've got a good friend of ours who works at Open Table, and he said it's amazing how many old restaurant owners fight because they don't want to pay that few percent type thing. 
And they said once they try it and they see the volume just explode, they're like, oh, I was wrong. Or they have a son or daughter that says, you know, mom or dad, we need to do this. But it takes some, there's a hurdle with, with older folks to accept open tape. And I've already talked about the financial health as in addition to physical, emotional, and spiritual health. There's an opportunity for healthcare to, to help people manage their finances and just manage their lives. That's why millennials are looking for a health coach or a life coach. And then what are you doing um, for um, wearables? Have you ever thought of maybe handing out wearables to certain groups of patients to help them improve their fitness? Next. And then lastly, uh, um, do you have enough female OBGYNs to target millennials? We talked about that. Um, price strategies are long-standing practices in virtually every other industry. Price transparency is here whether we like it or not. I'll tell you one thing that's interesting. In uh, some focus groups I recently did for ER, people were becoming indignant and saying, why do I get all these bills from you, the doctor, some yeah. firm I don't even know? Why can't you send me one bill and you divvy it up? Why is that up to me? Why can't you get your act together? They also said, if you can't send me a bill within one month, I shouldn't have to pay it. Yeah, I heard the groans. Think about it. I want a single bill, and I want it within a month. I think that's totally fair. I've been doing this a long time. I started doing system research back when systems actually started back in the mid-90s. And so what I found was the top two things people wanted from a health system back when they were new is I want a single billing system, and I want the left hand to know what the right hand's doing. We have not figured out either of those 20 years later. And then, again, they're searching for ways to de-stress. Do you have a way to talk to them, to help them in that way? They are listening. Then last. All right, so we're all done. Two things I want to leave you with, and uh, you can, it'll, be in the, it'll be in the handouts that you get. But if you want, you can download the white paper on our third annual healthcare marketer survey. That's where we entered about 240 healthcare marketers around the country and just asked them, what are you doing? What are you spending? How many FTE do you have? In what areas? How is your digital going? How's your CRM? I'll tell you, the top two things is, don't, and I know you're gonna laugh because it's common sense. We don't have enough FTE <clears throat> and we don't have enough budget in digital. And their biggest pain point right now is CRM is not coming through. It's not, it's not giving us what we need. The problem with that is, it's, this is a four to five year burn-in to understand CRM, but we kind of oversold it to the C-suite that we'd see results immediately, and we're not. So calibrating expectations is something we're not doing well with a CRM, and then we're kind of blaming the CRM system when we shouldn't be. And then lastly, I'm gonna be doing my uh, next omnibus in the first quarter of 2018, which will be here before we know. Uh, so I feel like I should say Merry Christmas, everyone. So um, if you've got any ideas for questions, anything that you're kind of, Rob, why don't you ask about this or that? I love getting ideas for new questions. That's what makes it kind of fun. So if you've got any ideas for questions, just email me. There is my email address. And with that, I will say thank you so much. Yeah, do it quick.